Kell. Hello. Uh, about two years ago, I was diagnosed with a fairly serious medical condition. Today I'm fine, thank you for asking, before you ask. But, um, but at the time, I did what I always do when I'm a little worried about something, and I start Googling things, and I realized I had very incomplete data to work with. So I called my oncologist, and I said, can I please have a copy of my pathology report so I can take a look at it? And he said, certainly, we'll fax it to you. And I said, okay. And so I went to my attic, and I got the fax machine that I bought in 2003, and I hooked it up to my landline, and I got my, my data, and everything's fantastic. And then I was telling a friend of mine about this, and he is blind, and he said, yeah, that's good for you, but what would I do? And I said, I don't know. And so I thought, well, maybe this is a gap, perhaps. So I started doing a little of my own non-clinical, non-academic, non-scientific research on this, and I uh, started talking to uh, 46 people with vision disabilities to get a sense of what their healthcare experience was like. And to the surprise of probably nobody, it was actually fairly abysmal. And in fact, one uh, woman, the, mother, the blind mother of a sighted child said, people don't understand that for blind patients, it is nearly impossible to dose medication properly. And changes and innovations are advertised as being wonderful for those who can see, can be dangerous for those who cannot. And I thought, yeah. And it's not just about being blind. This is Dana Florence. Uh, she is the owner of a nonprofit called 3 to b which lends uh, uh, support to uh, parents of kids with disabilities. She herself is the mother of three kids with cerebral palsy, three kids. And she told me once, listen, the most frustrating thing for a mother is knowing that there are things out there in university labs and in garages and all these things being built, and I can't get a hold of it. I just, there's no way to operationalize it. There's no, there's no CPT billing code for it. I asked my doctor about it. it. They don't know. There's no way to make these connective threads. And I know it would change my child's life if I just could get access to it. And something about this seems a little strange to me because we live in this era of advanced technology and the quantified self and all these things happening. And you know, we, we're talking about iPads in the doctor's office and Google Glass and the surgeons and we have beacons and the things we put on our bodies and all this stuff. And you know, we're getting to a point where I mean, we just saw a really cool presentation about like now my bathroom is about to capture all this stuff and not give me feedback, which is kind of frightening to me, but also really exciting in a way. And I think, are we advancing this stuff past the point to which people who have disabilities are going to be somewhat behind? Is that gap going to widen over time? And I suspect that is the case. You may not agree. That's OK, too. And I do know this, that as, as more healthcare goes online in the form of patient portals, um, we are looking at potentially a real problem for those who are living longer getting older, living with more disabilities. Um, the University of Michigan this year did a study on this, and they found that, hey, look, the frailest and most vulnerable patients may be at risk for increasingly disengaging uncoordinated care as more of this care moves to the online space. It makes sense, right? Now, I talk to people in technology all the time, and uh, you know, for one thing that comes up is you know, everyone's making all these patient portals, and if you have made a patient portal or a website or something in your, in, your, in your lives, I ask you, how many of you have actually tested it with a screen reader? How many of you actually tested it with someone with motor skill deficiencies? If you haven't, that's OK. No judgment here. I can maybe help you with that. But I talk to a lot of people in technology who think, I'm going to revolutionize healthcare because it's all broken. And they don't have no idea like how many interconnected, interdependent services have to talk to each other. They just don't have any idea about this. I mean, all these things come together. And by the time you marry it, marry it with the technology layer, accessibility can break down anywhere on this spectrum, in this ecosystem, anywhere. And then you take into account the regulations and how we're constantly managing costs and mitigating risks. It's complex. I make it seem like it's a simple problem. It really isn't. And this is why I have stopped thinking about this after many years of thinking about it quite a bit, solely about technology. I, to me, it comes down to touch points, and I've identified, in my own simplistic way, three. They are as follows. Chat, the conversation we have with our physician. Chart, the artifact of that conversation. And charge, the transaction. Chat, chart, charge. You know, I, I mean, I like things being simple. I'm not very smart. That's kind of where I look at it. So we'll take these one at a time. This is Denise Sher Jacobson. Uh, she lives in Oakland, California. She is married, one son, two PhDs, writer by trade. 
um, happens to live with cerebral palsy. And every time she goes to the doctor, she told the New York Times last year, um, she's made to feel like an idiot. They say, who's here with you? Well, nobody. Someone needs to be here with you. Well, why? We're going to talk about your treatment. Yeah, but, you know. And she told the Times, doctors frequently make incorrect assumptions about her related to her intelligence, her ability to interpret the, the data that's being given to her, her ability to make decisions. And I think this extends a little bit into the e-health space. Before I go into that, I want to point out a really interesting study that came out uh, from the Center for Quality Care Research in Springfield, Massachusetts, where they profiled 250 practices across the U.S. And they found that many of these practices were woefully inadequately trained in terms of being able to handle patients with disabilities. You can get in the building due to the ADA, but you can't necessarily be treated effectively once you get inside the office. And, and some people are calling it like the last bastion of civil rights discrimination. And that's a whole other topic which I'm not going to touch because that would eat into my time. But I do think that this, this starts to extend into the e-health space. And this is where we bring up the idea of electronic personal health records. And, you know, I remember when I got this line of numbers, I'm looking at it, I'm thinking, is all this important? And I had to actually talk to my oncologist and she said, no, I look at this, I look at this. You know, don't look at all these other things. Stop Googling war stories. Just concentrate on this. And that was an important lesson because I realized that maybe people don't want all the data all the time. Maybe they want it contextualized, right? Maybe they want the right care at the right time. Maybe they really do want to trust their doctors. And I think a lot of people I talk to do want to trust their doctors. So I remember thinking, I wonder if there's a great way to figure out what people with disabilities really want from their electronic personal health record systems. And uh, I got connected with these very nice folks at the National Institute on Disability and Rehabilitation Research and the Center for Biomedical Informatics at Children's Hospital in Philadelphia, where I live, and WGBH Center for Assistive Media. And they did this. And they profiled these data sets. And they asked 150 people with disabilities, what do you want in a personal health record? Electronic. And they ranked the features by one column, what was most important, and one column, what gave them the most satisfaction. And as you might guess, they don't exactly marry up one to one. We're very, very good at providing things like appointment reminders and things like that. Not so good at other things. And I love stuff like this because I like to look at the spread. I like to look at what are the things that people find to be the most important that we're doing the worst. Because that's our blue ocean, right? That's, that's, that's the opportunity. Uh, you don't have to do the math. I did it for you. So I gave you a top four. Ready? Want to see? Deal with me? OK. Number one is. I'm sorry? We are. Okay. <laughs> well, well done. So number one, having important medical information available during an emergency. 98% important, 21% satisfied. It's a spread of 77. That makes sense, I think. Transferring medical information to a new doctor or hospital. Number three, find the most important medical information relative to their disability. And number four, managing insurance issues like referrals, approvals, and costs. Tremendous opportunity here to help patients who have disabilities in this country. Okay. Talk about how you yes. I didn't make it. They profiled 150 people with disabilities. Over a third of them had multiple disabilities, and at, and they gave them a list of features. One column was importance. One column was satisfaction. And then I married up the spread between the things that were the least satisfying to the most important. Came up with those numbers. In other words, math. <laughs> so. And when I was collecting this, there's always a part of me that thinks, do I have it all right? Because I want to be very clear, I'm not a doctor, OK? I'm not an informatic professional. I, I don't play one on TV. So, but, I, but I did find um, a blog post by Dr. Wen Drapowski, who's a friend of mine. And she put out this post, like completely on a parallel passing. If you look at the costless Medicare cases, it's usually people who are elderly, people who are disabled, people who require long-term care and home care. Um, and there's a lot of opportunity here to innovate. Speaking of Medicare, I assume we all know about meaningful use, correct? We, we're all fairly familiar with that. You know? And if you don't know, it's about um, financial reimbursements that are paid to Medicare and Medicaid participating physicians who adopt meaningful use of electronic uh, health systems into their practices. And it's fantastic. Um, one of the problems, though, is that there are certain pockets of health care that are not eligible for this. For example, long-term acute care hospitals, rehab hospitals, psychiatric hospitals, and because they don't get those reimbursements, the adoption rate is really low, like 6% low. 
And you may think maybe that's not such a problem. Maybe it isn't. But it does. it is another systemic symptom of how the technology keeps evolving and there's a group of people who keep lagging back. Okay? So I've been doing a lot of complaining. And I don't like to be that way because that's not a very good way to live. So I'm going to give you some small things we can think about maybe to solve this. And it starts with understanding the social model of how exclusion works. And again, it's easy to, to pick on healthcare and say, you know, big bad healthcare, and people, but it, it doesn't start there. And I don't think it ends there. It really starts in grade school, where if you think about it, you have kids with disabilities, and they're put on a special bus, and they're taken to a special building, and they're given special friends, and they're told these are your friends, and you have special teachers. And that sequestering becomes a social norm. And I'm not saying it's our responsibility collectively to fix that, but we do have to recognize how and when and where that happens. Because once we do that, we can address something called a micromove tactic. What's a micromove? It's a barely perceptible tactical thing that's done without requiring a sweeping organizational change. For example, in Washington, D.C., they asked, um, in one hospital, they asked the resident physicians to take public transport and get an idea of what it's like to somebody to have to take two buses and a metro line to get to the hospital, realizing that going to the ER is not a cavalier decision, right? I mean, they have to actually make some effort. Things we can do in this space is perhaps do a webinar where you don't get to uh, use your mouse. You have to rely only on keyboard navigation. Or a video conference where it's only captioning, there's no sound. Small things like that to increase the empathy without necessarily going in and you know, making regulatory you know, missionary changes. Third would be the grassroots innovation. And I, I, I'm really amazed, and, and there's fantastic um, things up on, on the second floor with the 3D printing, and we keep reading stories about how you know, someone in a garage made a 3D printed hand and a prosthetic, and they gave it to their son, and now he's great. It's, you know, and there must be some way to bring this into the medical setting. I mean, this is where I think maybe we can bring back things like the clinical experience program, which could be like for things that are non-invasive, low risk, minimal risk things. Is there a way that we can get IRBs to start to understand how this happens? And you know, if it works for one patient, maybe it can work for five. We can collect data. Maybe it can work for twenty. You know, I'm not saying we have to like commercialize it overnight. Just, just a little. And I certainly don't want to rewrite how the FDA does things. Um, but I also want to think about like a, a more open portal to things like this that we know could help a lot of people. Like, for example, Ms. Florence's kids. Emphasizing touch points, not apps. I, I don't want to hear any more about blood pressure apps. I'm sorry. And if you made one, I, God bless you. I just, I, I don't need, I was reading one about there's an app in a seat cushion that can measure the blood pressure while I'm sitting. And I don't know if that's a good idea. You know, I, I, I do know that chat, chart, and charge are very key touch points that affect a lot of people in this country, you know, close to, 54 million people in this country. And I, I imagine there's a lot of silent pain out there that needs the innovation. I have a client, um, uh, a healthcare client, and they were asking, you know, how do we best communicate uh, with blind people? And, you know, we went over the blocking and tapping stuff like, well, make sure that your website's accessible and things like that. And we do that kind of, and I also said, oh, by the way, you know, let's, let's activate the front desk a little bit. Let's, let's see if we can get the front desk nurses involved with this, because that, I mean, healthcare is an industry where we've specially designed a waiting room, right? And if you're blind, you sit there surrounded by magazines you can't read and art you can't look at. So why can't we do simple things like use NFC technology to you know, take the iPhone, which has 57% adoption by unsighted users, and kind of boop, and deliver content, especially to them, through a channel that they all use, right? I mean, that's a, that's a lost touch point that maybe we should be adopting a little bit. And finally, building empathy through accountability. This is Dr. Michael Graves. He owns a medical instrument company. He is a former architect and artist. I, I like to say that disability is the one minority group that we, can, we are all subject to join at any time. And we're all likely to join at some point in the future. Guarantee it. If we're all lucky enough to live that long, we're, we're going to be there in some form or another. Well, he found out the hard way. He went into the hospital with a sinus infection, woke up one day paraplegic. Bacteria is weird. Sometimes we just don't get it. And he wrote a blog post, and I want to read it verbatim, because this spells out what we mean by empathy. <clears throat> Early on, my first day out of bed at Kessler Hospital, I went into the bathroom in my wheelchair to shave, looked in the mirror, and the bomb was at the height of my forehead. I couldn't see my face, so there was no shaving with a straight razor. An electric razor was brought to me, and I tried to plug it in, and it was out of reach. 
And I thought, well, at least I can wash my face, but I couldn't reach the faucet. So the next day, my surgeon came by. I asked him to get in my wheelchair. I strapped him in, and he couldn't reach anything. I asked, who designed this? And he said, experts. <laughs> so we do need experts, because I'm not one, and I rely on them a lot. Um, but I think we also need empathy. And to me, empathy is about making allowances for attributes that cannot be changed. My friend Carl Grove says that accessibility is really about providing a fundamental human service that can help more people in more situations. And I can't think of anything more fundamental than the preservation of our global health system. My name's Kel Smith. I run a company called Anikdo. Um, it's named after the Greek word for open. We have a health division that uh, we try to solve some of these problems with varying degrees of success. If you're interested in this at all, I wrote a book called Digital Outcasts, Moving Technology Forward Without Leaving People Behind. It was published by Morgan Kaufman last year. Uh, people tell me it's good. They can't all be wrong, I guess. And um, my email is kel.smith at anikdo.com. I want to mention some folks who helped me with this and let me use their data. Um, Dean Caravitti at the Center for Biomedical Informatics, Larry Goldberg at WGBH, Gavin Kerr at the English Foundation, Frank Lamachi at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and Jim Tobias. And um, with that, I will stop talking and take your questions.